as I share, uh, as I share what I have been studying and looking at over the past couple months, that please, Father, I pray that you would just bless these words. Let them not be mine, but let them be yours. Amen. Faith is a conviction of such strength that a person will rest the full weight of his life and future upon the God of whom he trusts. Now, I read this quote a little while ago, and it reminded me of a famous gentleman who lived in the early to mid-1800s. Now, by a show of hands, have any of you ever heard of Jean-Francois Javoret? I'm sorry, my French is horrible. One person, okay. That makes me super excited. All right. Um, let's see if we can get a few more hands. His more common name that he went by was Charles Blondin. Okay, one more. Okay. Now, Charles Blondin, like I said, lived in the early to mid-1800s, and he was famous for none other than his infamous tightrope walking skills. Um, from a very young age, I think it was about five, his parents realized that this boy had an inept skill for balance and went ahead and just started training him in the art. And after years and years of training and when he became of age, his parents allowed him to go ahead and join a traveling circus. Now, the circus would, as traveling circuses do, travel from one place to another, uh, reaching the forest the forest spreads of the country. And at each place that they went to, Charles, or excuse me, yeah, Charles Blondin, he was always very excited to see what new things he could try at each new location. So he, if he ever went to a place where there was a canyon or a spread, he would have one man stretch out his rope from one end to another and pull it tight, and he would try to walk across the gap. And if it was... Um, a more mild place where there weren't as many architecturally exciting things that he could work with, he decided instead to try a couple tricks. And uh, though this got him famous, his most infamous act came at none other than Niagara Falls. So the traveling circus had just arrived, and Blondin stepped out at the, at the lookout point at the falls, and he said he felt as if it was destiny knocking on his doorstep. He felt as if he could not go on unless he went ahead and crossed the span of the Niagara Gorge. And so at that, he went ahead and he started advertising this, sending out flyers all over the place. Come see the famous blonde and cross the Niagara Falls. And he had a commission built, or a commi um, he gained a commission that way he could end up investing in 1,100 foot long rope. And though it took a little while, the money eventually came in and he set up for the stunt. And when finally the fateful day came, hundreds of thousands of people came. Everyone was swarming around the lookout point. The place was packed. And so as he stands on one side and gets up on the podium, he says, who believes that I can cross the gorge? And the crowds cheered and cheered. And so he stepped up onto the line, and one step after another, he crossed successfully and safely. And people couldn't believe it because something like this had never been done. Something like this doesn't happen. But it did, right before their very own eyes. And so when he arrived on the other side, they went crazy cheering for him. And he quieted them down and said, Now, I know some of you had faith that I could make it across this thing. But how many of you believe I can do the same span again with a man strapped on my back? And at this, people went crazy. I mean, they had just seen him cross, but to go with another man? And at that... Uh, he, he silenced the crowd again. He said, okay, well, here's the problem. I have the rope. I'm set and ready to go, but I seem to be lacking a volunteer. Would any, would any of you be willing to hop into my back? I guarantee you it's quite safe. And at that, the crowd just died, just, just went away. And that day, 
Blondin wasn't able to get anyone to cross with him. But Blondin was a persistent man, and he went back throughout his life, and he crossed the Niagara Gorge many, many times, each time making it a little bit more daring than the last. I would not have believed it myself had there not been pictures taken. But he did all sort of, sorts of crazy things. Like one time he went ahead and he blindfolded himself and walked straight across the gorge. Just, I don't know how you do that. Um, <laughs> and other times he would go across or wheeling a wheelbarrow in front of him, just going straight across. Another time he went through in a gorilla suit just for the fun of it. And uh, another time, uh, he managed to get people to go ahead and set up uh, an oven out of the rock, and he stood there on the tightrope baking an omelet. So he was a crazy guy, but, you know, every single time before he made the crossing, he always sent out the same offer. Is anyone willing to hop into my back? I assure you, it's quite safe. You just have to have faith that I will get you there. And every single time, up until the last time, everyone turned him down. And then finally, at his last crossing of the gorge, his manager stood up and said, I'll take that leap of faith. And so, with two legs wrapped around his waist, one arm wrapped around his neck, and the other one stiffly grabbing onto his top hat, um, Blondin went ahead and carried the gentleman, one step at a time, safely across the gorge. Faith is a conviction of such strength that a person will rest the full weight of his life and future upon the God of whom he trusts. Throughout the last couple of months, I have been thinking and studying a lot about uh, studying a lot about faith in the light of salvation, what it truly is, what it isn't, and what it should really look like in our lives. And today, I'd like to share a little bit with you about uh, what I've studied and learned and seen. And for me, throughout this entire study, perhaps one of the most um, learning passages has been found in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 8, uh, particularly verses 5 through 13. It reads, When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but say only the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am, too, a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who follow him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. And skipping down to verse 13, it concludes by saying, And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Now, when I was looking at the life of the centurion, um, a couple things stuck out to me, three things in particular, and we're going to be studying those today. The first is faith at any level uh, requires a degree of vulnerability. Now, looking from the point of view of the centurion when he was going to Jesus, um, it's quite an interesting study. You see, Greeks were Greeks, the Greeks had conquered the Jews, and they were, uh, as they considered, far above them status-wise. And uh, because of that, it would be extremely abnormal for any Greek to want to go to the Jews for any assistance, especially on spiritual matters, as Greeks generally were not uh, monotheistic. Um, the centurion decided that he was going to go against the cultural norm and the biases that were held against the Jews of that time. And he decided, well, as he went there, it was also made clear that the centurion was not afraid 
that this would not be a private matter. He did not fear in seeking Jesus openly. And to approach Jesus um, and ask for healing for his, the servant, his, he must, uh, to approach Jesus and ask for healing for his, his servant must have at some time required of him a faith that was hopeful and powerful enough to abandon his cultural views and personal prejudice in light of what could happen with his faith in God. Next, faith is more than just believing. Believing something is true. It is an act of trust. The centurion had heard all the stories about Jesus and his healing power. Um, and the stories that he had heard of, were of Jesus, who a God, who a man, uh, who had the power of God, who was strong enough to go ahead and give sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and a voice to the mute. And this, and through the stories of this God, of this man, uh, he came to believe that he could do truly what the people said he could. But arriving at the presence of Jesus and publicly asking of him for healing was the scale of his faith. Having trust that Jesus could accomplish what was being asked of him, even though he had not seen it personally himself. And just recapping a little bit at the end, uh, starting at verse 8 of that same passage. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but, say, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I, am, for I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And finally, our own self-righteousness and good works is not how we achieve favor in God's eyes. Now, if we look at the life of the centurion, we can say that he, he was pretty well off. He was a pretty well off guy. He had servants. Um, he... Being a centurion, that means that he was placed in charge of a hundred men. So we know he was in a position of authority. So he was respected and held a degree of power within where he lived and where he was at. And though he laid down his prejudice and pride to seek Jesus, uh, all for the sake of his servant's life, it was because of his great and unquestioning faith that the servant was able to be healed not because of his list of credentials. Let's take a look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. It goes, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The way in which the servant was healed reminds me a lot of one of my favorite characteristics of God, and that is the way that God adamantly pursues us individually in our lives. When we choose to put our faith in God, he welcomes us with open arms, no matter where we are in life or no matter, how, no matter where we have been. But, you know, let's, let's face an honest truth. Like, I was looking at this when I was studying this, and just, it made me think, you know, a lot of times in life, even though I'd like to think that I would have the, uh, the resolute faith that the Roman centurion had, I find myself being a lot more like an Israelite that is doubting and wandering and unfaithful. And, you know, that is the one reason, or that is among many reasons of why I am extremely thankful that our God is a good shepherd and he cares for us even when we make poor judgment that separates us from him and his will. And this reminds me of a story I heard several years ago. It starts with a, with a man named Professor Chris. Now, Professor Chris taught at a seminary, 
and he had it where uh, he, he made an agreement with the other teachers that um, if any of the other students caused trouble or he just couldn't stand to have him in his class, they could go ahead and uh, kick him out and send him to his class at the end of the day. So sixth period would always wind around at the end of the day and people would always wander in. And the one person that was always consistently on his roster of people who weren't supposed to be there and were was a young man by the name of Steve. Now, Steve was a little bit of a troublemaker. Um, he would always come in right at the last minute, right before the bell rang. And as soon as the bell rang at the end of class, he would always jump up and be the first one out. Just couldn't wait to be done. And so one day, uh, Professor Chris decided he was going to pull Steve aside. And he, and as he, pull, as he motioned Steve over, he said, Steve, you think you're pretty tough, don't you? He's like, yeah, I do. I, I, I think I've, I'm okay. And he, he looked at his arms, and he saw that he was rather muscular. So he got an idea. He said, Steve, how many push-ups can you do? He's, and Steve got pumped up his chest, and he's like, I can do 200 every single night. He's like, oh, okay. Well, do you think you can do 300? And at that, Steve kind of started a little bit. 300. I've, I've never done 300 before, but I think I could do that. And Professor Chris said, oh, good. Okay, come ready on Friday to be able to do 300 push-ups in increments of 10. Got it? Good. See you Friday. So the week went past, and Steve went ahead and got ready for it. And the big day finally came. And Steve sat down right there in front of class, right and ready. And so uh, then it, right, right as the bell rang, in came Professor Chris carrying boxes and boxes and boxes of donuts. Now, these donuts weren't any regular donuts the students were about to find out. These were the ones that pulled out all the stops that had, like, the uh, cream inside and the frosting and the sprinkles. I mean, I mean, these were students on Friday at the end of the day being offered donuts. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. So they were getting excited there. And uh, as Professor Chris started class, he went ahead and opened up the box and took a donut out and wa walked up to the first desk in the first row and said, Christina, would you like a donut? And she's like, yes, sir. And so he goes ahead and puts it down on her desk. And at that, he says, uh, Steve, going to need you to do 10 push-ups for this donut for uh, Christina, okay? He says, all right, sir. Walks up to the front, does 10 push-ups. Done. Go gets up, sits back down. And the process continues where Professor Chris walks up to the ne next desk. Would you like a donut? Would you like a donut? Would you like a donut? And at each one, as the students are saying yes, Steve gets up and does 10 push-ups, 10 more, 10 more, and 10 more. And there's 30 people in this class and he's gotten through about two, two and a half rows before finally he's stopped by a student who, uh, who thinks, who, who doesn't want the push-ups to be done for him. He stops his teacher and says, well, you know, it's not fair that he's having to do all of them. Can't I do my own push-ups? And the teacher says, nope, uh, can't, can't do it that way but do you want a donut? And he said, well, in that case, no, I don't want a donut if I can't do my own push-ups. And at that, the teacher goes ahead, still puts a donut down on his desk and says, Steve, do 10 push-ups. And at that, the guy gets really mad. He's like, hey, I told you, I don't want a donut. He said, doesn't matter. Steve's going to do 10 push-ups anyways. And as it continues on this way throughout the class, more and more students start saying no, and no matter what, the teacher still puts a donut down and Steve keeps on doing push-up after push-up after push-up. Now, the thing that Professor Chris forgot to account for is that teachers, he told the teachers that he could go ahead, that they could go ahead and send the delinquent students to his class. And so always during class, a few more students would file in. And so as the class is drawing to a close, he notices that there's five more students standing in the back of the class Steve has already finished 300. Sweat is pouring down his brow, and he doesn't know if he can do it much longer. But uh, Professor Chris turns to Steve. He's like, you still got it in you? He's like, I've still got it. I've still got it. 
and keeps going, do you want a donut? Do you want a donut? Do you want a donut? And at the end, finally, at 350, Steve's arms buckled, and he fell onto the floor. And at that, Professor Chris patted his back and turned to the room and said, And so it was that our Savior, Jesus Christ, pled to the Father, Into thy hands I commit my spirit, with the understanding that he had done everything that was required of him. He collapsed on the cross and died. And like some of those in this room, many of us leave the gift on the desk uneaten. In our journey through life, may we accept the gift of salvation that the Father has already paid for us, not through our doings, but through his own. May we seek to be vulnerable, ensuring our faith in both his love for us and his promise of salvation are fully resting in his hands secure. May we know that faith is a call to action, requiring us to do more than just believe that, that God's words and promises are good, but that we can trust and have peace knowing that our salvation is secure in him. And finally, may we remember that God's gift of salvation is open to everyone, no matter their past or current situations. God's love for us never ceases. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for the love that you have for us. Thank you for your gift of salvation and that it is a gift that is always there with us. It never leaves and there's nothing more or less that we could do to make you more or less fond of us. I pray, Father, that you would be with each one of us in our walks with you. Please let us be sure in the salvation that is offered and let us be comforted by the knowledge that your love is always present and always all-consuming. Let us be a light to others and help share this gift that you have given us. I pray this in your precious, holy, most wonderful name. Amen.